All right, everybody, welcome to How to Recession Proof Your Job Search in 2024. Um, it's now February, which is crazy since we just went through those weeks pretty quickly. And we're excited to have you here to talk about a very pertinent topic because even though it doesn't feel like a recession or it doesn't feel like we're not in a recession, well, actually, what am I saying? Even though we're not in a recession, it feels like one with all the crazy layoffs going on. And we want to have and host this webinar today to talk about how you can set yourself up in case that comes and hits you soon, especially if you're in tech. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, so, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, uh, I'll say, go. Do you want to intro or should I intro? It's up to you. I can go ahead and intro. Um, so this yeah. webinar is being uh, brought to you today by Albert's List. Uh, my name is Albert. I'm the hey, founder Albert. of Albert's List. Hello. Uh, and we were founded in 2013. So we've been doing this for about 12, 11 years now. And it's a job search community with more than 49,000 job seekers, hiring managers, recruiters, career coaches, and more. And so we host a variety of different events, including this very type of workshop you're attending now, mock interviews, hiring fairs, and everything in between that has anything and everything to do with your career, your personal brand, and more. And so uh, you can drop the link in the and uh, see the link in the uh, webinar chat that I think Elisa will drop here shortly. And so uh, today you're going to hear from three of us. Uh, my name is Albert, as I mentioned, and I'll hand it over to Joe for an introduction from him. Yeah. So thanks, Albert. I've been a member of the Albert's List community for not quite the full run, but pretty close. I've been around since somewhere in the late 2014, early 2015 run. Good friends with Albert and Elisa um, and have been sort of the moderator and part of the community. My background is uh, working in marketing and communications, especially uh, and a bit of journalism, but especially in startups and operations um, and tech. Um, and then now I run my own business, which is a coaching and training business. Wonderful. And Elisa. Hey there, I complete this trio and um, similar to Joe, like if it feels like I wanted to say that we almost hit a decade, Joe and I, but I guess maybe more a decade in dog years, but um, <laughs> Joe and myself were, you know, community leads and moderators, part of the Alberts List volunteer army. Um, we're really here just to support and add value where we can in the community. And then just Stemming from COVID, um, we've really honed in on um, some of our job search boot camps just because of the rising need within our communities to have a more tailored, focused approach. So that is um, driving a lot of momentum and um, focus right now. And with these recession um, webinars, we really want to focus on for those that are um, part of the great stay that want to stay in the current job, but want ways to revitalize it. We're here to support there. Um, for those that are actively job seeking, what are a couple ways to jumpstart and revitalize that job search? So um, thanks so much everyone for spending time with us tonight. And the conversation doesn't stop here. So I popped in our LinkedIn contacts. Feel free to get a hold of us if you want to um, continue on. Perfect, let's go to the next slide. So the agenda today uh, is pretty, pretty extensive. Hopefully we'll be able to cover a lot of it in the next 50 minutes. Uh, we're going to start with where the market stands now, because it's always important to know where we've been and where we're going. Then we're going to talk about how to think about your job search. And then I think a favorite part of this webinar is really good coming going to the things that you came here for, which is five strategies to recession-proof your job search that Joe will cover. And then we'll do some Q&A. And go to the next slide. So I, I always like to do this where we stand now slide because I think it's important to know where we have been uh, to help set up where we are today and where we're going. Uh, as you know, it's been a pretty crazy time uh, since the beginning of January 2022 and really now into uh, January 2024. And even in early February, we have seen a crazy amount of layoffs. And, you know, if you've been laid off, raise your hand. Love to see, you know, what's going on here. But as you know, it really peaked uh, last January when we had Facebook and Amazon and um, and Google 
for the very first time, uh, have mass layoffs. And these layoffs continue till today as companies have now moved on from uh, re from 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 changing their way over from uh, having laid having hired too many people during the pandemic, and now into their reasoning of wanting to transition into AI. Let's go to the next slide. And so while this is all going, strangely enough, the unemployment rate has stayed for the most part at 50-year lows. Uh, since peaking at 14% or so during the pandemic, it has dropped down to as low as 3.4%, even as recently as last April. Now it's up to 3.7%, and really, who at this point really even knows? I read the jobs report, I see one thing, and then I see the communities that I manage, and it's a completely different story, and I'm just not quite sure at this point. But, you know, it's really interesting, and uh, and it's something to behold. Let's go to the next slide. And so this combined with the future of work trends presents for a really interesting future in the office. Uh, we all know about some of the trends that are going on in the workforce. These include... Uh, returning to the office. These include the AI, uh, the emergence of AI and whether it's going to threaten our jobs or not. Um, and then it also uh, goes into the area of skill building, which, you know, what skills do you need to survive and thrive here in the future? And, you know, these are just some of the many trends in the conversations that are going on. Next slide. And so one of the things that I like to look at when I look and examine the state of the job market is even though the large companies might be laying off, uh, one of the ways to check the heartbeat of where the economy stands is what startups that get funded. And so I go to various different places, whether it's uh, Crunchbase, CB Insights, um, various other webinars that are held by startup-based organizations. And this is what, you know, were the biggest fundings in Q4, right? And if you see the pattern that commonly sees in, that you see in Q4, outside of, you know, companies like Jewel Labs, which has been around for a while and is in the vaping space, and, you know, outside of your general infrastructure stuff like mobile and telecom and the internet, well, some of the biggest fundings that we've seen to date uh, tend to be in sustainability and generative AI. And so when you think about it, this is what's on the minds of investors all over. They're thinking about climate change. They're thinking about how that will impact our world. And not only are they thinking of that, they're also thinking of uh, artificial intelligence and its ability as part of the fourth or fifth industrial revolution, depending on your opinion, on how it's going to change work and increase productivity. But more so, what's most interesting about all of this is that the startups that currently exist on the market also serve as a barometer for maybe skills or types of companies that you should go and think about working at. The closer you are to a company's core interest or a company's emphasis for the next year, five years, or 10 years ahead, the less likely you'll be laid off. So that's not part of the five tips that you'll be receiving from Joe later, but it is, I guess you could say, tip number six. <laughs> so 2024 overall is going to be an interesting year, right? So I, I know that we... Uh, I know that we have been seeing the uh, the layoffs that have been going on that kind of pale in comparison with the uh, with the jobs reports that we've seen, right? The last, I don't know how many months we've seen positive jobs reports numbers. It's really difficult to say where things are going, um, but they're they're nonetheless going in that particular direction. Um, in addition, the emergence of AI requires thoughtful pivoting and resilience. So, you know, learning to use ChatGPT, learning to use these new tools, but not abusing them. And then being able to understand the ongoing trends, whether it's who's hiring, who's firing, or even leading up to the presidential election, particularly here if you're in the United States, and knowing what those trends look like on a given year out year basis are things that are important. And then most importantly, above all of that, knowing that you have your own fate in your hands and having a trusty framework that you can leverage to get to that next step. Let's go to the next slide. 
So we're going to talk about here how to think about your job search before we hand it off to Joe, who will offer um, very valuable tips and what you all came here for. So let's go to the next slide after this. So one thing I think about when it comes to a job search is all the elements that matter when it comes to uh, when it comes to what needs to go into your job search. And one thing it reminds me of is the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those of you who may have been seen, who have seen the Maslow's hierarchy of needs for the very first time, uh, it is a it is a diagram slash framework that that talks about what humans every day need in order to feel like they have physiological safety, um, love and belonging, self esteem, self actualization, and so forth. These are all the necessary things that you need to feel to at least feel like you're a human being or somebody who can be high performing. And this is actually a topic I'll be talking about tomorrow on how to systematize your job search. So if you want an in-depth uh, dive on what this looks like, including the next diagram, which is what I will be talking about, which is the idea of systematic thinking and having that right foundation and having uh, all the elements that strengthen your candidacy. And so on the next slide, you're going to see what that looks like. And this is what I like to call the hiring hierarchy. The hiring hierarchy is what I also like to describe as the things that are necessary in order to be an effective job seeker in any economy, whether the economy is great or whether the economy is in complete shambles, like sometimes how it feels right now. And so when I look at the state of the economy and the hiring hierarchy and things related, I think about how you need certain qualities in order to be an effective candidate and a candidate that companies are looking for as they, uh, as they look to fill their ranks and try to maintain themselves through the type of economy we're in now. And so when you look at this diagram, it's all about what you see at the bottom two rows because those often tend to be the most necessary. The first row is very attitude driven. You need to have the hunger, the hustle, the self-awareness, the resilience, the attitude, and the commitment to say and wake up in the morning and say that you want to get that job, right? Job hunting is a constant habit that you must undertake in order to be truly effective because if you're not consistent about it, especially in this market, other people will overtake you and what it is that you're doing. The second level, which we'll also be talking about a lot, is the fundamentals of the entire job search outside of who you are fundamentally. These include writing a strong resume or cover letter. They include creating a personal brand where people know who you are, what you do, and it's pretty evident what your value proposition is. It's the ability to be great at networking, the ability to know where you can go and find the jobs that you want to work at, having the right skills, and mastering your interview. And then as you move up the hiring hierarchy, it's all about being able to see your job in a way where you understand the vision of what you're going to do in that role, whether you're going to be there for six months or whether you're going to be there for three years. And so that's the ability to have that level of vision, knowing your metrics, knowing the strategies that you want to employ, and then dictating that level of leadership. And so when I look at this diagram, you know, two things come to mind, right? One, you must be extremely overwhelmed. And two, how the heck do you employ this? And so two, we're going to talk about that today. But number one is to understand what's absolutely essential. I don't expect anyone and everyone to be in this room today to be a leader, but I do expect that they understand how to build credibility, which is leadership in itself. I may not expect everyone to have and understand how to look at the metrics and KPIs that they have in their role, but I do understand and know that they can talk about their success rate as it comes to projects. But what's absolutely fundamental and what's absolutely what you need in every single job search is the ability to interview, is the ability to network, is the ability to build your personal brand and, and identify and articulate your selling proposition. The stuff at the top, you can learn a little bit later, and it also comes as you become more experienced. And thankfully today, we're going to offer you a combination of both. Next slide. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Joe, who's going to uh, give you these, give you the strategies you came here today for. Joe, over to you. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Albert. Um, I, I really like the way you position that. And I, what I always say to people is, you know, understanding the market that you're in, understanding the landscape and understanding your role and what you need and want in that market is, is so, so critical because um, one of the realities is that if you sort of um, 
there are things you can arrive at in an unplanned manner. And I, I wouldn't recommend that with a job search, right? And I don't mean that um, in the sense of like any of us arrive perfectly at the beginning, right? That's not possible. But your job should be to try to, you know, as Albert has mentioned that that session of our your job should be to sort of systematize the process in a way that works for you. And every single person on this call is going to do it differently, but the the basics are sort of similar. So we're going to talk through, you know, some, some pretty uh, sort of straightforward tactics. Um, and I just also kind of want to mention when you think about at the bottom of that pyramid, you think about kind of like, you know, having the right attitude and resilience and just, you know, this is also about knowing you're going to get knocked down a bit. Right. And for folks who've been job searching for a while, and I know we've got a few folks who've kind of gone through some layoffs. You've probably gotten knocked down a bit already. And so part of what we're trying to do is give you some stuff that helps you, you know, get momentum and, and feel good about the search and kind of structure in a way that works for you. Um, so we, you know, we sort of talk a lot about kind of what does a scalable search look like? And I'll, um, I'll let me open up a template and kind of share it with you real quick. Let's see. Start so job search stages. And I'm pretty, I tend to take a pretty uh, kind of, Let's see, staging. I tend to take a pretty low key approach. So you'll see me kind of popping open a few windows as we go along. Um, one of the most important things is just to kind of assess where you are in the process. And I'll go ahead and share probably the easiest way to really quickly kind of access all the stuff that I'm going to mention in the presentation without sharing all of the individual links is just to drop the folder here. Um, that this is for our eight weeks to employ bootcamp. These are open source materials. We'll talk more about that but this presentation is right here. So if you wanna pop open that PDF and have access to any of the links, et cetera, um, you know, here we go, I'll drop that in, drop, or in the chat and we'll come back to that you know, a couple of times over. But I just wanted to mention that you know, when you think about sort of structuring your job search, um, one of the things that we always talk about is just making sure that it's set up where you have sort of stages with clear conversion points. That's a little bit of like marketing speak. So what does that actually look like? Um, this is sort of a doc. Again, that's in that main drive folder. This is a doc about kind of structuring your search in, in stages. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff in this doc. I'm not going to go in really, really deep. But the essential part is to kind of, when you think about how you set up your time and your tasks and the way that you kind of systematize your job search, is just be clear when you're switching between stages. And an example of that would be, you know, top, top stage is stage one. This is all about finding sort of job opportunities. Um, a lot of people approach the job search and, you know, and, and I'm just going to give you an example. I've been there, I've done it. So there's no judgment from my end where, you know, we see a few jobs and we're like, oh, that looks really cool. I'm going to spend my whole day applying, uh, you know, and then you're like, wow, that, <laughs> that I didn't get it done today because it was like kind of a stressful approach. And so structuring your search in stages is really helpful. Um, so instead of sort of like doing it all at once, you know, maybe, like if you don't have any jobs, you know, any jobs in your queue where you have interviews set up, well, maybe focus on sort of moving it to that stage, right? So stage one is finding opportunities. Um, and there's a bunch of different kinds of examples here about how to kind of um, systematize that process. But at the bottom, you essentially, you know, the conversion point is, you know, you find a job, you scan it, okay, this looks like a fit, and then you put it in your job opportunities tracker and you mark it, apply to, right? And I don't think I'm saying anything here that's, you know, sounds super fancy or rocket science, but a lot of people will, you know, get up in the morning and, and again, I've done this myself, we'll get up in the morning, uh, we'll spend a bunch of time, we'll kind of get buried in different job, you know, boards and sites, Indeed.com, LinkedIn, you know, uh, newsletters, uh, Slack groups, Facebook groups, et cetera. And instead of just sort of like scanning, okay, that's a fit, copy that link, put that in my tracker, we just get kind of lost, right? Or, you know, here's another common kind of problem that happens is we're maybe trying to do work two stages at once. Um, so maybe stage four, which for us is labeled as interview prep, we're trying to switch cognitively between finding an opportunity and doing interview prep all at once. And that's a lot of work for you all. That's a lot of work for us mentally and emotionally to kind of switch between these stages all at once. So what I usually recommend is, you know, just the very first step in your job search when we work with folks is, you know, go make a copy of this doc. Um, you could download it if you want to put it in Word or something like that. Um, and basically just identify where you're at, right? Because if you are, for example, you know, doing a pretty good job of getting, finding and applying to jobs, you're finding lots of stuff that seems like a fit. You're getting lots of, you know, good screener interviews but you're not really getting very, you know, very far past that, well, then you're at the sort of interview prep stage, right? There's something you need to do in that interview prep 
staging that you know kind of gets you set up. On the other side of the coin, if you're applying for a bunch of jobs, and you know, and this is very common too, we hear this where uh, you know, I talked to someone the other day who's like, I've applied to a thousand jobs and I've got no, not a single phone screener. That's pretty frustrating. That is a hard place to be. Uh, there's something off, right? And and for that, you know, that's a different diagnosis for every person. But for that individual, you know, it might have been the resume positioning, might have been kind of like, well, you're focusing on a whole stack of different jobs. Maybe you're not quite finding the right stuff that's a fit. There's something there you got to work on, right? And again, the staging isn't intended to be, you know, everybody's a little bit different, but the goal is to just kind of help people diagnose where they're at um, in a given moment. And also given that cognitive load, stage it so you can switch between them, um, you know, so that you're not trying to do everything all at once because that's not, you know, that's not sort of the highest quality moment for you. And also it's, it's a bit frustrating to be in that process too. Um, so going back to the, this example, uh, the, you know, there are different things you can do. And again, you can sort of click through and, um, you know, check things like this job tracker. I won't look at this in great depth, but, you know, setting up a job tracker where every time you find a job that's a fit, you can put it and kind of label it. This is a great Airtable template uh, that Selena Mendoza is a great product manager and product leader created. You can tell just even from a quick look how detailed Selena is, uh, you know, product manager mind at work here, a lot of tags, a lot of labels, a lot of structure, staging. Uh, but you can, you can use something like this. Mine, you know, the one that I've kept for many years and just kind of keep going, you know, just pay attention to it. It's not nearly this sort of organized as Selena, but having a tracker is sort of half the battle, I think, with that too. Um, so those are just a couple of examples of things that you can do. You can also sort of think about managing your time by using, you know, like a job search calendar, um, which I'll show you an example. You can use things like, you know, Asana or Trello or Monday.com. Uh, if you go back 10 or 15 years, you know, your, your sort of project management options and task management looks a little different, but now they're all pretty similar. If you've used, you know, Trello sort of cards or board structure for, you know, managing tasks, then you've probably, you know, you're probably pretty familiar with Asana or something else like that too. Um, so, you know, whatever the case might be, everybody's a little bit different. Um, hang that noise. What you can't see is I just spill water on my keyboard. I'm like, oh, hopefully it doesn't die in the midstream. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of the process um, of, you know, kind of making sure that you, A, figure out what the staging is that you're at, you know, B, sort of, you know, use some kind of job tracker. Again, everybody's a little bit different. Um, and then have some type of time or task management. Like this is the sort of an example calendar that I have for job search for folks. When you think about like cognitive load, um, you know, a good example would be like this. So instead of, you know, just kind of wandering around, you know, you're setting up your time so that you're spending 30 minutes or an hour, you know, maybe looking through specific links to specific parts of sites. Like this is a, you know, this link goes to a, you know, design jobs section of a site that I pay attention to. We've got Albert's list on there. We've got some other job boards. We've got our job tracker linked. We can click through, systematize the way that we do it so that we're not spending any extra time. Um, you know, as, as it sometimes happens, we'll end up doom scrolling social media. Very easy to do. We've all done it. Uh, but just sort of structuring your time and tasks. And, you know, look, if you're not a calendar person, you're a list person, maybe you make a list for Monday or Tuesday or morning or whatever the case might be. Everybody's, you know, again, a little bit different, but just having some structure to that, I think sort of goes, um, you know, goes a long way in that process. Uh, we also have a job search tool that we run that I just want to mention really briefly. This is something that um, Elisa has spent quite a bit of time on creating um, along with uh, Lucy, why am I forgetting Lucy's last name? Lisa? Thompson Ott. There we go. Sorry. My brain just, well, too much information. But anyway, um, Elisa and, and, and Lucy set this particular tool up. And there's a lot of really excellent stuff in here. For example, if you prefer, you know, a spreadsheet sort of version of your tracker, and you also kind of want to rate jobs and things like that, this is an excellent resource for, again, for the organized mind, right? Where you're like, let me score my, rank my different opportunities and things like that. Really cool little kind of, um, you know, process for that. And there's a lot of other good stuff in there, including lots of things that we're talking about today, uh, you know, additional job boards and things like that, that are really helpful. Um, anything else in there, Lisa, you want to highlight before I move us along? Um, no, just honestly, the way we have it set up is just if you um, are recently impacted by layoffs or you've been in the job search for a while and you want to try like a different process or framework to jumpstart, your um, 2024 search, 
So that's kind of how the different tabs are geared. Um, you know, the first one is just kind of your newsfeed. It walks you through the process. And then as you move forward uh, on the different tabs from left to right, it will move you further down the funnel in the job search process. Um, just keep in mind, it's, it's, um, you know, it's a work in progress and it was put together by us volunteers. So we don't have potentially an eye for like user-friendly tools. So if you know someone that has um, interest in volunteering to spruce up the tool, we'd love to hear from them. But um, yeah, we're always looking to add to it. So if you know of um, like current links or ones that you found helpful, let us know. We're also hoping to add a tab on like ATS tips. So I'm working on that, just things to look out for, because I know that's a big trip up for folks when they're updating their resume to get past the recruiters, to get to the recruiter screens. So um, yeah, so feel free to reach out to us if you want to be part of the um, like help with open sourcing this. Just making sure I'm not electrocuting myself. Um, perfect. Yeah, this is there's a lot of stuff in this tool that I'm not going to go into, but it's super helpful. And uh, I definitely recommend digging into it a little bit for folks who are coming back to kind of reorganize their search a little bit. Um, and, you know, the only other thing I'll sort of say about this section, you know, I think a lot of this, we kind of most of us intrinsically sort of know like, oh, these are things that I should be doing. Um, you know, when you think about kind of that pyramid that Albert mentioned and just kind of the things that are at the bottom, you know, it's pretty common when you're organizing your search to, you know, sort of fall off and have to come back and kind of reiterate. And so I always just remind people it's an iterative process, right? Um, you know, uh, who among us has not sort of been optimistic about calendaring our time for the next week? You know, we look at it and go, gosh, I just didn't do a lot of those things I wanted to do. Well, that's okay. So make some time in your calendar on a weekly basis to say, oh, this worked really well, or oh, I didn't, I didn't like that. That just didn't sort of, it didn't, it didn't work for me. And so then you change your, you know, the way you use your time, or you know, maybe you're sort of testing out, okay, you know, using some type of list app or a reminder app versus a calendar versus like a sauna or Trello or something like that. And you find out that you like, you know, okay, that works really well for you know, for fine, you know, for when I'm kind of tracking jobs, but that doesn't work so well when I'm doing interview prep. And, you know, it's, it's an individual process. So I just remind people to be flexible um, in that sense. It, it, it's something that's kind of individual for each person based on their style. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention really quickly is just kind of touching on AI tools. Um, I'd be curious to know how many people, um, maybe you just put like a, a note in the chat, uh, maybe a one if you are currently using AI tools and maybe like a two in the chat if you're thinking about it or haven't done it. Um, be kind of curious to know. We're always curious to see what people are sort of up to and using in a given time. I feel like most people are using some sort of AI tool. So, okay, we've got a bunch of ones. We've got some twos as well that are popping in. Yeah, okay, that's good to know. Yeah, and I think most people are using, now sort of using some, you know, some type of tool It might vary. And, you know, there's a sort of a lot of different stuff out there right now. You have, for example, these sort of all-in-one tools like Teal. There's another tool called Cheeky that I'm aware of. Uh, but there's quite a few of these sort of like, you know, do everything all at once. And I would say they're sort of in, they're sort of a work in progress. Um, I like Teal and I found it helpful um, for a few features, but it, the whole thing doesn't sort of speak to me as someone who uses and practices with these tools to stay up to it. Um, I think a lot of these tools are still kind of in process and they're gonna continue to get better. Um, individual tools, I think, are a little more advanced, um, and so that's something that I would I would definitely mention. Um, I'm not going to go into this Zapier article, but this has some really great examples of. Um, and again, the PDF is sort of in that link I shared to the to the Google Drive folder with all materials. But basically, there's different kinds of you know AI tools that can kind of address specific things. And so, what I often say to folks, and I'll I'll stop after this and see if Elisa has any feedback as well, but um, is use it for a specific purpose. So. I'm going to take a wild guess and sort of figure that someone who's on this call is probably, you know, just put in the generic prompt to chat GPT. Hey, write me a cover letter for a, you know, product manager or for, a, you know, support or operations manager. And, you know, the, the output is not so great. And there's different reasons for that, including these tools, sort of um, maybe the training data not being that great or casting too wide a net. 
it's a little bit better if you use it for specific purposes. So if you're using an AI tool like BART or ChatGPT or one of these other kind of more specified ones, you know, maybe instead of sort of a generalized prompt, you're doing something more specific like, hey, I'm going to share three key impact points from my um, you know, my resume, can you uh, give me a couple of versions that punch these up so the language is more action verbs? That's a more specific request, right? And so these AI tools are able to, you know, especially with the language LLMs, the language models, they're able to do something a little bit more. And so that's just an example of sort of where I think we're at with AI tools and what I recommend doing. Um, Elisa, do you have any thoughts on that? I know we've talked about that a little bit kind of in general. Yeah, um, I mean, there's just a ton of AI tools out there. Like with we ran this webinar last Monday, and there was a lot of um, discussion around like how, like what tools to use for what, because there's a lot of overlap. They all claim to help with like to be an AI powered resume builder. They all, you know, help with scoring like job fit based on your resume. So, um, just we're starting our winter um, job search bootcamp. So we spend a, quite a bit of time talking about this just in terms of like AI tools and then how you go about which to use for what stage and what might make the most sense. So if there's interest in there, please connect with us on that because AI um, leveraging AI tools is a big focus. It's We know some part of the job hunt is manual, but a lot of it is now being optimized. And so if you don't embrace it, then um, you are putting yourself at a little bit of a, dis a disadvantage because everyone's using it. But I will say like, I definitely um, plus one to what Joe said with some of these more mainstream ones like ChatGPT and Bard, you do have to be very prescriptive about prompting and potentially multiple prompts to train. Like I know ChatGPT is user-based. So when you sign into your account, every time you feed it more content and are more prescriptive about it, it will become smarter and spit back what closer to what you were looking for. Um, so I play around there a lot just to figure out like what are those subtle nuances to get closer to what, um, you know, like what the ATS is looking for or like I'm trying to write an event description. How do I make it closer to what I'm looking for? Um, sorry, and I just saw that Harold popped the question, can't the ATS identify AI generated documents? Um, like I would say that what the ATS's goal is, is different than like, it's not set up to identify or to look for AI generated documents. It's basically a tracking software that recruiters and, and folks in HR use to um, keep track of all the candidates, especially moving through qualified candidates. And I mean, I'm simplifying a lot of it, but it actually is scanning for different keywords and different um, criteria within the resumes that are submitted to identify ones that are a better fit. So it's not so much identifying AI generated documents as it is just filtering down to who are the strong candidates that are fit for the role. Um, Albert and Joe, feel free to weigh in on that, but that's my um, kind of two cents there. Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing to note, because this question does come up a lot, and you know, this is sort of one of those interesting things that uh, you know, I'm on LinkedIn a fair amount and, uh, you know, I feel like I read, you know, a couple of times a week, some job seekers, like I just discovered that I'll never get an interview because the AI has decided whether I can, you know, can do the job or not. That's not happening. Um, it may happen in the future. I'm not ruling it out, but I think, um, it's really important not to obscure sort of the nature of what is sort of actually occurring. And, I will not, I promise you, I will not go off into a big rant about AI. I have lots of opinions and thoughts about the way it's being implemented. I think the most important thing to know is that we are using AI tools. We do not have AI as artificial general intelligence where you're like, AI, who's the best? Who's the fairest one of them all? Like AI can't, we don't have tools that can do that. And, it, and you know, we may be a long way from artificial general intelligence. So at most you have you know, um, some software and platforms starting to use, um, you know, AI tooling specifically, which again is run by people. It's not a general magical robot. Um, so some of that tooling is being used to filter and sort, um, you know, content, but it's still very early. And most often, most of the time when you submit your resume for a job, um, you know, the most of that sorting is just like, you know, find me applications with people who have the title product manager for a product manager job. 
or who have the title product manager and maybe specific skills or tools or things like that. So you're not looking to game the system in that sense. You just want to make sure it's easy to show up in those results and be that a recruiter, a hiring manager, an HR generalist can quickly scan, you know, they're looking at 10, 15, 50, 100 resumes that are kind of have a few of the top keywords. Okay, is this, okay, they're cool. They've done this job. Okay, got it. They, they use these tools. Perfect. Yes. Put them in the yes pile. That scan is very fast as we all sort of are familiar. Um, so it, it, that's another reason that, you know, you want to be prescriptive about using these tools is, um, you know, if you're putting sort of generic content out there, that's not, you know, like a resume or cover letter, et cetera, um, you know, that quick scan will kind of rule you out too. Not saying that we won't get to a place where AI tooling will do more of that work. I wouldn't be surprised if it did happen, but right now the legal implications of that um, prohibit the vast majority of companies from messing with that because there could be a lot of serious issues with that, which I won't go into. Um, okay, strategy number two, keeping us moving right along. Um, I think one of the things that most folks sort of struggle with is, is some variation on like, I could do anything for anyone. Very cool. I believe it. We're all quite multi-talented. Typically, we all have multiple interests, but it's very hard to build a job search around like, you know, sort of very disparate areas. It's hard when you, again, you think about the bottom of that pyramid that Albert kind of talked about, like being able to show up and kind of be consistent. Um, it's it's super hard. And so I think it's, it's more important typically to be specific and sort of look for your niches that really fit you. And so this is just marketing speak, you know, look for the, the riches and niche, the niches. Um, and the goal is to be specific, but not too specific. Uh, typically, you want to kind of create a watch list and sort of go after, you know, um, following companies and people and signing up for newsletters and finding job boards in that kind of area. Um, because those people are people that are going to get you, you know, into jobs. And you can also kind of keep an eye on those folks ahead of time. Um, and this example is like not a perfect example, but let's say you're in the, you know, you like to work for startups that are sort of funded you know that you like that, you know, you don't want to work when it's really early because they tend to be a little chaotic, but you like working then when there's still a lot of stuff to be defined and kind of, you know, entrepreneurial. Um, so maybe you're looking for series B startups in the social impact space that haven't had any layoffs. Feels like a lot of venture back companies had layoffs, but there are some that haven't. Um, and so an example of how you could sort of do that would be, um, let me pop open a browser tab. Oops. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is actually one of my sort of favorite examples from uh, Shani Benzer. I think Shani actually is no longer at Crunchbase, but used to be the CMO at Crunchbase, which is sort of like, you know, Albert mentioned CB Insights and Crunchbase and some other things. They're like databases for companies, essentially. Uh, and you can actually do some really interesting stuff. Um, so in this particular example, Shani sort of talks about using, you know, Crunchbase to filter. Um, oh, and by the way, Shani is now CMO at Ernest. That's a fintech company. So if anybody on this call is in fintech, I believe it's a venture back company. I was looking at it the other day. Um, so there you go. There's some leads. And I know the marketing team is hiring. So if you like fintech and you're in marketing, bam, here's a person you can reach out to. Um, I know there's still a couple jobs posted for that team. Uh, but anyway, so Shani sort of describes how you can use Crunchbase uh, to actually find companies that have a certain funding round that haven't had any layoffs reported. It's so cool, right? Kind of a, a quick sort of easy niche. Um, you know, you may or may, this particular search may or may not be highly sort of high value for you, but it's an example of how you can kind of find stuff that's, you know, that that's a fit. Um, other things that you can do, um, you know, I'll give you a good example, like, um, you can sort of look up the funding or the finance of a particular company. I, I like the public earnings tools. Uh, so Yahoo Finance has all the sort of standard stuff where you can look up and see sort of what the revenue generation looks like. You can read quarterly earnings to see, you know, what products are doing well at a particular company. And I'll give you an example that I think is a good one. Uh, you know, I haven't looked at it in a minute, but GoPro would be a company that, you know, uh, is sort of like, a blended hardware software company. They've got, obviously we know GoPros, put them on your helmet, take video. They also do some processing in the cloud of content. And now they're also doing some kind of subscription-based stuff. And so some of that, like if you go look at, you know, the revenue right now, I think when I was looking at it six or seven months ago, you know, GoPro was, you know, their core business still doing pretty good, but their new subscription business doing, you know, it's not like it's making insane amounts of money yet, but it's very, very healthy. So if you're a product manager, and you're looking at options, 
uh, you know, and, and you're thinking, oh, wow, I have some interest or experience with that side of the house. Um, you know, that's a good example of a company that you could kind of find a niche, right? Um, and, and you could even, if you really like that niche, you could say, okay, go, go pro competitors. Who are the people that are the competitors to go, go pro subscription services? I don't know what those are offhand. I'm not, it's not an area for me, but, you know, you could sort of make that a niche that you go into. Um, and there's lots of other things you can do, like using Google alerts, you can use, you know, PR Newswire or Business Wire to, you know, follow news releases in that particular category. Um, obviously, you get into sort of niche job boards and things like that. But again, the more sort of specific you can be in your search, I think sort of the better off you are. Um, if you haven't tried any of these sort of tactics, uh, make sure to pop open or download the PDF of this. So you can kind of click through and, and play with some of these as well, because they've got some good, um, some good examples of how to, you know, get sort of value out of them. Um, and I, and I think in general, you know, I don't, I don't have a particular recommendation for how many niches you might follow, but, you know, I think, um, I usually recommend, you know, three or four job titles across five to eight industries or kind of niches or areas. Uh, and you play with it and you find out, you know, I really like these areas, but not these other ones. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that aspect. Um, and I think, you know, part of that niche aspect is also just to see sort of where you're at um, in terms of your, you know, where you might match, right? Because sometimes we're, particularly for folks who are job searching that are, you know, maybe kind of considering getting out of tech or shifting away from tech or something like that. You know, you might be sort of thinking like, okay, wow, there's some other options or opportunities out there. And that's where some of those niches kind of come into play. Um, the other thing that I recommend a lot is to pay really close attention to what we call sort of recession-proof skills. Um, and these are things that are going to be important and useful, you know, basically no matter what, right? So a perfect example of that would be data. Um, and I know it's not like we have a bunch, bunch of folks on this webinar who are like, I'm a data analyst or I'm a data scientist. Um, you know, there might be, I would, I would be surprised if there were a couple, but you're probably not all sort of consider yourselves data experts, but you probably work with data in some, fa you know, fashion. And so an example would be like, um, you know, maybe you're on the support team for an e-commerce brand and, you know, look, you're not the data analyst or the data scientist, but you, you know, in the, in the context of doing, you know, some of that e-com support work, you're sort of the master of the spreadsheets, right? You're known as somebody who can kind of, um, you know, download and analyze data. Well, that's a data skill, right? Even if it's not like a heavy part of your job, it's something you could position or focus on. Um, and really data is sort of like, you know, what company doesn't need it, right? And there's all these sort of little, you know, sort of key points two and three here, there's all these sort of little areas that you could be good at. You know, gathering data could be like, hey, I, you know, turns out I informally became the survey person for my team, right? And I do, you know, we run surveys pretty regularly. And so we, we sort of gather and structure data, you know, we format it. Maybe, I, you know, I'm the person who cleans it up in spreadsheets. Maybe I'm the person who's known as sort of, you know, really good at presenting, you know, creating a quick deck or presentation or analyzing it, uh, you know, quant, qual, et cetera. Um, so these are all the, some of the examples of the ways that data sort of probably naturally gets used in your business or, you know, in or around the role that you're in, in some fashion. And it's an opportunity to, you know, to essentially kind of reposition. Um, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that in a bit. Um, another aspect of positioning, you know, that definitely falls in that recession proof kind of category is, so we're seeing, you know, we've now sort of moved to this place where everything went remote because of the pandemic. And then you get this sort of, you know, return to office. I'm not going to sort of tell you my opinion about that. I don't necessarily think that all work needs to be in an office. I think that's kind of an outdated notion. But, uh, you know, regardless of what your opinions are of remote versus flexible hybrid in office work, there's definitely a need for people who can kind of navigate all of those things. Um, and so someone who's got experience with, you know, tools or strategies or, you know, different kinds of ways of working across these different modes, that's a really important and useful sort of recession-proof skill. It's going to be needed no matter what happens going forward. So here's just a few examples of positioning. Um, again, you know, this could be like, you know, in your summary, it could be in your cover letter, it could be, uh, you know, at the top of your LinkedIn, depends on how you might use it. But, you know, first example is just sort of like, okay, I can, I'm somebody who's experienced with, you know, doing sort of hybrid, you know, remote flexible work using a Exxon Excel. Uh, you know, second example, you know, again, I was kind of sort of tipping the hat to that already, but let's say you work on the support team and you're really good at kind of downloading and then, you know, creating a quick kind of insights about customer user data. 
Um, and then obviously the third one is sort of a mix of all of those, right? So these are different, very practical examples of how you can, um, you know, essentially kind of use your data sort of, you know, data skills, remote skills, et cetera, to position yourself in a way that's, you know, high value and, and very needed. So strategy number four, we're cruising right along, uh, is translating tech skills to government and nonprofits, uh, maybe sort of outside of sectors that you've worked in or are used to. Um, I won't go really heavily into sort of how this works, but, um, you know, essentially there's a lot of stuff that's high value. So if you worked in tech, for example, um, you know, you might have to switch your search a little bit. Um, it's not that government or, you know, nonprofits or other folks don't necessarily use traditional sites, but they might use them a little bit differently. Um, you know, same thing with government. Obviously, USA Jobs is the, you know, federal jobs. You've got governmentjobs.com, which handles all the state, local, regional authorities. Uh, you know, pretty much those two are the biggies. Uh, you've also got sort of industry newsletters, forums, listservs, and things like that, which are still, you know, quite useful. And what I often tell people is if you are transitioning from like private sector or tech, into government or into nonprofits, you know, really one of the most important things you can do is find people who've done that or who are kind of translators um, and just sort of see what they did and get their advice and guidance. And so that's sort of reverse engineering that process. Um, and one of the reasons is because, you know, the way that you're positioning yourself is probably going to be different. Um, so just as an example, you know, if you worked in customer success in tech or maybe account management or something like that, you know, some of the things that you did would absolutely translate to, you know, nonprofits or social impact or government work, but it would be called community outreach or training or, or something else, right? Um, and so the positioning is a bit different. You have to just kind of know the lingo. And again, you know, connecting with somebody who's actually, um, you know, made that, that shift is different. And one other thing I will say about, you know, I think there's sort of various uh, things that you learn in talking with people who maybe work in government if you're trying to get into that. Uh, but, you know, the competition's a little bit different, right? So like if you're working for a local or state government, yeah, it might not be Google money. It might not be, you know, meta money, but you might get a much stronger, you know, uh, contribution to 401k. You might get that pension, right? Because there's state pensions and things like that, that those, you know, governments pay into uh, and other benefits that may be of, of high value. So the salary may be lower, but the, you know, the other things may be worth it and the job stability may be worth it and things like that. And those tend to be less competition. And I can just tell you because, you know, I've worked just next to government a little bit. And I also, you know, know folks who work in government, uh, you know, sometimes they get one or two qualified applicants. They might get, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 applications, but most of the people are not qualified. It's very common for them to be like, gosh, I just need a couple more people to fill out my pool of, you know, potential, you know, qualified applicants. So, you know, the jobs are a little less, uh, you know, on the salary side, but the benefits are sometimes a little bit better, different, uh, you know, stability, and then obviously the competition is less. So that's another thing to kind of consider. All right. So strategy number five, and then we can definitely do Q&A and kind of dig in. Uh, this one is not going to sort of blow your mind. It's all about networking. Uh, we do a lot of this in the eight weeks to employ boot camp, which we'll talk a little bit more about, kind of give you a heads up on in case, you know, folks are interested. Uh, I think networking and kind of just connecting with folks is, you know, something to build into your search. It's not everybody's favorite thing. If you're introverted, you know, it's probably not something you love, but it is something most people can learn to do in some way. And these are sort of the principles of it. Um, you know, one is just to really keep the ask small. Um, and the classical example I always give is, you know, if you're reaching out to somebody cold and you don't know them, or maybe it's a past colleague you haven't talked to in, you know, six years, eight years, 10 years, uh, you know, just keep it, keep the ask small and, you know, hey, checking in, noticed you, you know, you made the transition from this to that. I'm actually making a similar transition. Would you be open to a quick question? Yeah, okay, go for it. Maybe I respond to your question or not, but, you know, you you ask permission first. That sounds pretty easy. Yeah, knock yourself out, right? And then keep the, you know, keep that question small, right? And sometimes you can do that with informational interviews and things like that. It depends a little on your style, but, you know, starting sort of small and, you know, uh, you know, keeping that conversation going. Like one of the classic ones that we always kind of remind people of is, you know, if you're applying for a job or you have an interview, find some people on or around that team, send them a quick LinkedIn DM and say, hey, uh, you know, I'm actually interviewing for this job coming up. Uh, would you be open to a quick question? I'm just curious, you know, is XYZ a workplace you'd recommend to friends, family, or colleagues? Very easy. If they say yes, oh, cool. Thank you. That's really helpful. I appreciate that. If I think of another kind of quick question, would it be okay if I reached back out in a week or two? Yeah, no, go for it. No problem. 
Uh, and by the way, if they say, no, I wouldn't recommend it. Well, then you have something to look into a little more, right? There's some, <laughs> some red flags, um, but then follow up, right? So keep the ask small, keep the conversation going, make it organic, you know, find some ways to connect with folks. Um, and then obviously just making sure that, you know, when you're reaching out to other job seekers or, you know, to past colleagues, friends, family, make sure they know what you're really looking for. So you might, you know, craft that intro, talk about those niches that we were kind of mentioning and just make sure that people are, you know, clear. And if it changes, then, hey, would it be okay if I, you know, reached back out and updated you on kind of what my search looks like? It's changed a little bit since we talked a month ago or a couple months ago. Yeah, no problem. Go for it. So you're just kind of leveraging that, you know, that networking aspect, I think is really um, sort of helpful. And then I think, um, Albert, you're going to kind of close us out with sort of the fundamentals reminder, right? Yeah, so it definitely can talk about the uh, rest of the fundamentals, which I think are also an important piece of the job hunt that maybe you might forget along the way. So, you know, in this type of job market where things are tough, uh, the basics matter more than ever. So remembering to cross your T's, dot your I's, following up. And, you know, remembering how to leave a good impression and leave people better than you found them is incredibly key as a part of uh, just basic job hunting. And then I think just to take it a little bit further up from that, also using AI is important too, right? It's the hottest thing. You know, you've seen enough people say things like, uh, how if you don't uh, if you don't use AI, then somebody who uses AI will replace you. And you know that's important, but it's also important to note that AI is there to assist with whatever it is you're doing. It is not there to replace completely, because you can see when you have in, you have in fact used uh, ChatGPT to write that cover letter or put that resume together, and that will often put you in the no pile. Next slide. And then the next other piece is that your attitude means everything. So something that I've been saying for a little while now is that it's important to not take a great resignation mindset into a return to office world. So, you know, what that really means is that in this world where uh, a lot of layoffs are going on and the job market is getting tougher to uh, work within, having that great resignation mindset uh, really takes you away from the flexibility and from the resilience that you need to display as you go through the job market because it is harder to find that role. Uh, more importantly, it's also important to stay consistent. As I mentioned at the top of this presentation, it's important to not just want a job, but also to uh, get to a point where you're consistent about moving forward um, to getting that job with consistent actions every single day. And then possibly the final and most important thing out of all of this leading up to the boot camp that we're going to talk about here in a moment is having accountability and community, having people who can hold you accountable and having a support mechanism around you is incredibly important to finding a job because it can be a very, very isolating experience. Next slide. And so the next part I want to talk to you about here is to talk about our eight weeks to employed bootcamp. And so this is the part of, uh, of, of really executing upon the job search that Joe, I, and Elisa have uh, helped many over the last couple of years engage with it. And so if you're having trouble with your job search, whether it's understanding where you stand or mastering the fundamentals of resume and other materials or learning how to network or learning the interview, uh, this is something that we cover in eight weeks of our instruction. And uh, in these eight weeks, you not only get to speak to individuals like Joe and I around your job search, you also get to meet other experts such as recruiters and coaches within the job search ecosystem to help you out. Next slide. And so in addition to these four things that we mentioned earlier, we also talk about navigating change, building credibility, offer letters and negotiation, and any topic that you find that is important around your job search, particularly in the environment that we have right now. And so, you know, with given, given how tough the job market currently is, um, you know, it's important that you're able to uh, that you're able to find not only that level of accountability, but the skills that help you stand apart from everyone else who's also uh, applying for jobs at the very same time. Next slide. And so in addition to being as a part of our boot camp, 
you get the accountability that you've been looking for with an ongoing LinkedIn chat. Um, you have access to all three of our emails. You have weekly office hours to vent or answer any of your burning questions. And on the premium level, you also have the chance to work one-on-one -on -one with Joe, Elisa, or I. And so uh, just to think about you know, what it looks like from a uh, from a pricing standpoint, because I know uh, many of you may be job searching at this moment, the cost of joining this program starts at the price of, let me make sure, $295. And so $295 over eight weeks gets you that level of peace of mind where you know, it covers our costs. And then it also allows us to uh, help you in the best way that we can possible. If you want the ability to get that one-on-one -on -one time, that'll be just $100 more at $395. And so that's an opportunity to meet with us uh, on a weekly basis, spend those times in office hours. And I know common questions include how much time do you actually spend? Um, I would say it's about one and a half hours for you know every weekly session plus another hour for office hours during those eight weeks. So you're probably looking at 20 hours of job searching time together, plus any homework that you'll be doing or any additional networking and tasks that uh, come up as well. Um, next slide. And so who's our bootcamp for? Our bootcamp is for people who maybe needed a job yesterday. If you've been looking for a job for the last eight, nine months and you're tired of doing the same thing, and you're one of those people that's going to message Joe and say, hey, Joe, I've applied for a thousand jobs in the last nine months and I've gotten absolutely nothing. It's time to change the way that you've been working. It's time to learn uh, how to get referred. It's time to learn how to meet the right people who can help you push your application forward. If you're looking for accountability, community, and support, this is also something that could be for you as well. Um, you know, right? So we hire personal trainers at the gym when we need to work out. Uh, we hire a financial advisor if we need somebody to help us uh, keep us accountable so that we don't make rash financial decisions. And in our careers, we hire career coaches or we invest in career services so that we can get the most out of our working lives so that we can go back to serving our families uh, and raising, raising our families and serving our communities. Uh, this bootcamp is also for those who have been out of the job market for a while and want to learn how it's been done in 2024. We've had individuals who've joined our boot camps who have been working at the same company for the last quarter century or more. And obviously, if you were job hunting in 2000, social media wasn't around, LinkedIn wasn't around, you were pounding the pavement, you were sending emails through Yahoo Hot Jobs, um, and you were attending in-person fairs, which is completely different from what's going on today. And then finally, if you don't know how to job hunt, if you're a new graduate or you're somebody who's just always gotten by and been really lucky by wildly sending applications into nothing and you finally want that process that we've been talking about today, um, this is the way to get yourself in and get that structure that you so desperately want and crave so that you can systematically hunt for your next job and be effective at it. Next slide. And so, um, you know, we with the takeaways from tonight, and we'll follow up with both the webinar link for the recorded video and also to sign up, is that, you know, we have the ability to help you create that scalable job search. It's important for us to uh, have these skills because as the market becomes more and more nimble and more and more unstable in some ways, being able to protect ourselves from all the insanity that happens is incredibly important. And what I should also mention, um, given going back a few slides with this boot camp, if you do find yourself in a precarious financial situation, because this is our flagship event and something that both Joe, Elisa, and I are incredibly passionate about, uh, please reach out if you need financial assistance. Um, we are happy to provide it, and it is important to us that you gain these skills because it's not getting easier, I don't think, for the next couple of months at the very least until at least mid-year. Uh, Joe and Elisa, do you have any takeaways yourself? Uh, yeah, I think. Go ahead, Lisa. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I mean, Albert's done a great job just overviewing the boot camp. Um, and 
just a little bit about us three because we're the ones that are facilitating it. I I think what's really unique is we are we share the cross section of like three different POVs, right? Like Joe has deep background um, from early stage startup to like enterprise wide organizations, but he's um, recently broken out of his own and has started his own company. So for those that are interested in that area in growing their job search or having um, like side passions and want to explore that full time, like Joe can be a great advocate and coach for that. Um, myself, I've primarily been in the W2 space, like working um, for you know large corporations, but across different sectors within like healthcare, um, tech, and like CPG, entertainment. So if you're interested in getting in there, happy to go more into it. Um, so it's it's kind of nice to be able to like get your questions answered in office hours, but then have a more customized approach. All of the resources that we've developed are open source. We make it free to the public because we feel strongly about democratizing access to it. But I, again, Albert and Joe has heard me say this so many times. I liken it to like what I do with CrossFit, like joining a group, um, like joining group classes. I need that guidance and I need a teacher, a coach to lead me through it, especially in a group setting. And so it's really a strong fit for those that are serious about their job search or serious about get, you know, changing things up in their current role, career elevation. It's all of those things. Um, you're going to get a lot of value out of this and we'll make sure to support you depending on what you're looking to get out of it as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think the only thing I would add to that was just, um, you know, I definitely resonate on that and agree with you, Elisa. I think like the, you know, I'm one of those people like it does help help to have a team, you know, have the accountability piece that Albert mentioned too. Um, I think, um, you know, I think one of the realities of, you know, I won't sort of tap on it too much, but like hiring is not the best process and that's not your fault. That's not anyone's fault. It's just kind of a shit show. Sorry for cursing. Um, you know, the process of finding a job and going through the interviewing and hiring process, it's just kind of a, it's hard. It's a hard process and there's lots of problems with it. Um, and so that's another reason I think that just making sure that you have, you know, a good structure in place and also that you have a team and, and folks that are kind of taking good care and, and helping you, you know, sort it out. Cause sometimes it's, you know, as simple as, oh, wow, I have another job seeker that I stay in touch with. And you know, someone I can open the door and say, this seems really bananas. Is this bananas? And the person goes, yeah, no, that's bananas, right? Like, so half of the sort of challenge, I think, in a job search is um, just making sure that you have a team and folks that, you know, are kind of in touch with it, with you and help you with the accountability piece. If you fall off, which we all do, they help you kind of get back up and get back on it. That's really important. Um, and then I think the other half being just kind of the structure piece and focus and, and staying consistent and things like that. And, you know, we're really serious about it. I'm, you know, I, I always say when we do any of these webinars, I always say like, you know, Lisa and Albert know this, I'm not a hard sell person, but um, if you do the boot camp, we will advance you significantly. We're very serious about it. We always show up in the same sort of manner to make sure that folks' job searches are, you know, that you get good momentum, that you start to feel better about it. Um, if something's not working, we help you diagnose and figure out what to do next. Um, all those kinds of things we're quite serious about, um, you know, because we've sort of been there and done that. And we know, you know, we know there's a lot at stake for folks um, and, and for you and your families and, and um, you know, and furry families. I don't have kids, but we've got dogs and things like that. So whatever blend of family you have, we know you're quite serious about providing for and, and taking care of your your family. And uh, yeah, we're, we, we approach this in a spirit of humility and service and um, you know, the way that we do it is always kind of from that place. Cool. So are there any questions? I know we've gone over the top of the hour. We will follow up with this with you with a recording. And uh, we're definitely here to support you as you go through uh, your career endeavors this year. All right. Well, Without any further ado, um, we should also let you know that this boot camp starts next Monday yes. at uh, six o'clock Pacific, nine o'clock Eastern. So if you are interested, uh, we'll be sending out uh, some follow-up emails over the next week, and we will be sharing the video with you as well as uh, other elements of this program that will be beneficial to you. Um, and so without further ado, 
Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you all so much for spending your time here. And uh, we will see you again soon. Bye, everyone.